The year was 1619, and a Dutch trading ship carrying human cargo from Africa arrived at Point Comfort, near the young settlement of Jamestown. Modern-day pseudo-historians claim that this arrival of slaves to the British colonies in the Americas established the true date of American history, a history and a nation built upon the backs of slaves. The truth, however, is that neither slavery nor America was founded on that fateful day. Slavery had existed since the beginning of human existence, as the earliest civilizations began warring with and conquering each other. The Hebrews were enslaved by the Egyptians for over 400 years. The population in Imperial Rome was estimated at over 50% slave. Slavery is alluded to throughout historical documents, art, and literary text as far back as written history allows us to explore. America would break free from the tyranny of the British Empire in 1776 and establish the beacon of freedom that is the United States of America. And though slavery would persist for another nearly 80 years, there was a spirit of liberty coursing through the veins of all Americans, free and slave alike. Christianity, it would seem, was the remedy for drawing out this spirit of liberty throughout the course of American history. Despite what modernists think today, the American ideal and this nation was founded on Christian principles. The first settlers to the British colonies in the Americas did so in the pursuit of religious freedom for their brand of Christianity, a brand that led to their persecution in England. This Christian foundation would be what the African slaves would encounter upon their arrival. Sadly, however, in many cases, the masters did not live out their Christianity with their slaves, and this was a dichotomy of thought that would have to be redressed in the future for the sake of the nation. But as stated previously, every nation or kingdom throughout history practiced slavery at some point in time. The real question, one must ask, is, which of those nations or kingdoms abolished slavery? If one does his or her due diligence in researching the answer to that question, the undeniable correlation to be found here is that Christianity was at the heart of emancipation movements. Oftentimes, when we hearken back to the American Revolution, we associate that spirit of liberty with the Enlightenment ideals of Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and the other founding fathers. But this spirit of liberty comes not from the Enlightenment but from the Great Awakening that spread throughout the colonies like wildfire a mere 40 years before. This spiritual awakening stirred within the soul of the colonists a sense of liberty that was not granted by men, but endowed to us by our Creator. This sense of liberty would eventually trickle down to the slaves, and there would be a similar spiritual awakening amongst the slave populations. African slaves who were captured by other Africans, specifically those from Western Africa, did not endure the journey across the Atlantic as Christians. Mostly they practiced shamanism or some other tribal animist religion. A significant majority of them converted to Christianity at some point after their arrival in the New World. Some of them were converted by way of Spanish friars in the Caribbean before moving on to the mainland. Others were converted by way of Protestant clergy or laymen in the British American colonies, and more still were converted by way of enslaved African Christians on colonial plantations. Those converted while slavery existed in America from the colonial period until its abolishment with the 13th Constitutional Amendment in 1865 played an integral part in the dismantling of slavery as an institution and left an indelible mark on America as a Christian nation moving into the future. For those who were converted to Christianity while enslaved on American soil, there are a select few for whom thanks should be warranted. James Oglethorpe, when founding the Georgia colony, outlawed slavery from the outset. This dictate was immediately revoked by Oglethorpe's successor when Oglethorpe returned to England, but the colony at least began with liberty for all in mind. 
The Pennsylvania colony was likewise established as a slave-free colony by William Penn and his Religious Society of Friends, or the Quakers. Though most of the converted slaves came by way of itinerant missionaries, largely originating from the Baptist and Methodist churches as a central feature of the Second Great Awakening. There were still others who made a concerted effort to evangelize the slaves specifically. Affectionately known as the Apostle to Slaves, Charles Colcock Jones produced a manual and a methodology on how to teach the slaves through religious instruction. Other slaves, such as the noted abolitionist and orator Frederick Douglass, were fortunate enough to receive instruction as children from a benevolent member of the master's household. This instruction, much like all instruction in the colonies during this time, was of a religious nature. Still, there were others who came to Christianity through other slaves, or had the benefit of attending a nearby church or other such Christian gathering. The First Great Awakening had such a profound impact on the American colonial landscape that it not only was the primary driving force for revolution in America, but its roots would trickle down to the plantations where we would begin to see crops of African-led churches sprout up in each of the 13 colonies. These churches, like the first African Baptist church here in Savannah, Georgia, would play a major role in the revival of the young nation through the Second Great Awakening, as well as ultimately the emancipation of slaves, as we will discuss in the next chapter. George Lill, a slave from Virginia, was brought to Georgia by his new master, Henry Sharp. Sharp freed Lill and encouraged him to minister to the slave population in Georgia. Lill became the first African American to be ordained a minister in the Baptist church and would set out on the work that Sharp envisioned for him, the evangelization of the slaves in Georgia. Of these slaves, David George and Andrew Bryan would play a major role in solidifying a congregation of slaves and former slaves that would ultimately evolve into the congregations of Silver Bluff Baptist across the river in, in South Carolina and the first African Baptist church here in Savannah, Georgia. The first African Baptist church was established in 1773, would it, but it would not be officially recognized until 1788. It would follow a similar course to that of black congregations all over the newly formed American Republic, as it would continue to grow in size and influence in the slave communities. This church grew to over 2,600 members by 1832 before it finally started building the structure that we see here today. The building was completed in 1859, constructed by free blacks and slaves alike. The slaves were only allowed to devote time to working on the church once they finished their work for their master. This showed the dedication the slaves had to their faith, that they would forego rest after a tiresome day in the field to build the structural symbol of their faith. The slaves also expressed their faith through song. The Negro spirituals were a way for slaves to embrace their faith, and as an expression of their sorrows and their long hoped for freedom from bondage. Songs such as Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen, A Balm in Gilead, and Go Down Moses are just a few examples of these spirituals. In Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen, for example, the sorrows of the slave life are expressed. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory, hallelujah. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. It is an expression of the trouble and sorrow brought on by the life of being a slave, but the hope of a sanctified life in Jesus. These spirituals would become more than just catharsis for the unbearable life as a slave. They would also be used as a coded language to pass information about opportunities to escape. That is, when a conductor for the Underground Railroad might be passing by, or where to meet this conductor, and 
how many people might be involved in the escape. Affectionately known as Black Moses because of the way she led people out of bondage into the promised land, much like the biblical version of Moses who led the Hebrew slaves out of Egypt into the promised land, Harriet Tubman used the song Go Down Moses to identify herself as a conductor on the Underground Railroad to slaves looking to escape. In his 1855 autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom, Frederick Douglass refers to the use of song as coded messages. A keen observer might have detected in our repeated singing of old Canaan, sweet Canaan. I am bound for the land of Canaan, something more than a hope of reaching heaven. We meant to reach the north, and the north was our Canaan. This time is a stop on the Underground Railroad. The church was built with this purpose in mind. Hidden chambers for hiding slaves was built into the structure of the church beneath the floorboards. Of note, when you enter the sanctuary, you can see the pattern of holes on the floor in the pattern of an African religious symbol, the Congolese Cosmograph, that more functionally served as breathing holes for the hidden slaves. Under the cover of night, the escaped slaves would leave the church and stow away on ships in the nearby port of Savannah, headed northbound to the free north, or Canaan. Again, that was another example of the church working as conduits for emancipation. All told, there were some 40 churches in slave territory that served as stops on the Underground Railroad. Two major errors in reasoning allowed for the institution of slavery to flourish in the American colonies and subsequently in the young American nation. First off, Africans, it was preconceived due to the color of their skin, were considered less than human. Property, and much like other inhuman beings, were lacking a soul and therefore were incapable of converting to Christianity. Much like animals, if you will. Even to a lesser degree, those who attributed humanity to the slaves held them as humans of a lesser race, incapable of learning and being receptive to education, including religious education. Secondly, a number of slaveholders and proponents of slavery referenced the Bible as proof of their divine right to keep and use slaves. First of all, Abraham, the father of the faith, had slaves. Secondly, the tenth commandment states, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Thirdly, Paul's treatment of the slave Onesimus, the servant of Philemon. Paul returned him to his master as a courier with the letter addressed to his master. Of course, in the latter example, Paul was requesting of Philemon to accept Onesimus as a brother in Christ, and no longer as a servant, going so far as to receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on my account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thy own self besides. The Apostle Paul, far from supporting any divine right of slavery, was advocating for the monument of Onesimus. The deeper we get into the American Republic and the Second Great Awakening, the closer we get to recognizing the humanity of the slaves. The more educated free blacks that we see interspersed in the populace, the less they are seen as a lesser race with inferior intellectual capacity. Lemuel Haynes, the first black ordained minister in the Methodist Church, proved as much in his ministry with a predominantly white congregation. How can a subordinate individual serve as the shepherd to a superior race? He used his position to advocate some of the earliest ideas of the connection between the Christian faith and the veracity of emancipation. In his Liberty further extended, 
Haynes draws inspiration from Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, but, as the title states, extends it further to include the slaves. Liberty is a jewel which was handed down to man from the cabinet of heaven and is coeval with his existence. And as it proceeds from supreme legislature of the universe, so it is he which hath the sole sight to take away. Therefore, he that would take away a man's liberty assumes a prerogative that belongs to another and acts out of his own domain. Shall a man's color be the decisive criterion whereby to judge of his natural right? Or because a man is not of the same color with his neighbor, shall he be deprived of those things that distinguish him from the beasts of the field? Haynes's arguments are the same arguments that would be taken up by Frederick Douglass a little over half a century later. In a more scathing rebuke, Douglass states, I therefore hate the corrupt, slave-holding, women-whipping, cradle-plundering, partial and hypocritical Christianity of the land. I look upon it as the climax of all misnomers, the boldest of all frauds, and the grossest of all libels. Never was there a clearer case of stealing the livery of the court of heaven to serve the devil in. I am filled with an unutterable loathing when I contemplate the religious pomp and show, together with the horrible inconsistencies which everywhere surround me. We have men stealers for ministers, women whippers for missionaries, and cradle plunderers for church members. The man who wields the blood clotted cowskin during the week fills the pulpit on Sunday and claims to be a minister of the meek and lowly Jesus. The slave auctioneer's bell and the church-going bell chime in with each other, and the bitter cries of the heartbroken slave and drowned in the religious shouts of his pious master. Revivals of religion and revivals in the slave trade go hand in hand together. The slave prison and the church stand near each other, the clanking of fetters and the rattling of chains in the prison and the pious psalm and solemn prayer in the church may be heard at the same time. The dealers and the bodies of men erect their stand in the presence of the pulpit and they mutually help each other. The dealer gives his blood-stained gold to support the pulpit and the pulpit in return covers his infernal business with the garb of Christianity. Here we have religion and robbery, the allies of each other, devils dressed in angels' robes and hell presenting the semblance of paradise. The illusion of ignorance, inhumanity, and racial inferiority began to erode and would be supplanted by a kindred spiritual relationship between the white and black brethren. The church would split over slavery first, soon followed by the national split with the Civil War. Four years of fighting later, with more American casualties than all other American-involved conflicts combined, and the slaves would have their freedom with the enactment of the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution. The slaves in America often saw their struggle relatable to that of the Hebrew slaves' bondage in Egypt, and like the Hebrews, they had their Moses, they had their Canaan, and ultimately, they had their freedom.